the the first thing I wanted to know is perhaps you could tell us a little bit about um, I don't know if you can ta start talking about it yet actually I know you guys uh, at CEPA are presenting a report on the Brazilian economy which hasn't come out yet but perhaps there are some key conclusions you could share with us at this point yes the paper is done and it will be released officially on, on Monday so we looked at the changes in, in well we looked at the major social and economic indicators economic growth uh, inequality poverty uh, during the last uh, decade, well, really since the Workers' Party uh, took office, which is in 2003. And there's really been uh, some some major uh, changes. Um, first of all was growth. I mean, the Brazilian economy hardly grew at all for almost a quarter century uh, before uh, 2004. Um, and so the rate of growth uh, for from 1995 to 2002 was uh, just 0.8% uh, per person. And for uh, 2003 to 2014, it's been 2.5%, so more than three times as much income growth per person in the economy. And that's not looking at the changes in the distribution yet. But that's a really huge uh, change. And that includes the recession. The world recession, you know, where Brazil went into recession in 2009, the financial crisis, of course, before then in 2008, and also the slowdown of the last uh, few years. So in spite of all that, uh, it's been a massive change in growth. And that's most of what allowed the uh, country, uh, the government, to reduce uh, poverty. Uh, poverty was reduced uh, by uh, over 55% and extreme poverty by about 65%. So those, again, are, are major uh, changes. And uh, it wasn't, of course, um, just... So so over uh, 31 million Brazilians have been lifted out of, across the poverty line uh, in the last decade, and 16 million uh, uh, coming from extreme poverty. Now... Uh, it wasn't just the, uh, of course, the economic growth that was the biggest part, but there were also programs and there were changes in the labor market as well. So I can go into those if you want as well. Well, you're talking mostly about the um, kind of the the what happened with the economy in terms of its impact in terms of reducing uh, inequality and reducing uh, poverty. But what would you say would be were the main causes? Uh, of those changes of the of this uh, tremendous improvement that you're talking about, what are the main policy uh, uh, aspects that that caused this uh, change? Right. Well, okay. So most of the changes in most of the reduction in poverty is due to the the huge increase in growth over this period, and of course, employment, which goes along with growth. Um, and that, I would say, I mean, some of that, of course, is due to favorable external uh, conditions, which is the you know, world market uh, commodity crisis, world economic growth, uh, at least until uh, 2010, and then it became, you know, unfavorable. Um, but I think the um, so 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 that's uh, but it's not really. I mean, if you look at you know why did the Brazilian economy grow so much faster uh, over the last decade than it did over the prior uh, twenty five years, and some of that is policy. Okay, so the government had government had a good expansionary uh, policy counter-cyclical policy when the world economy went into recession. So the economy rebounded quickly, grew 7.5% in 2010. Uh, so that that helped. But the uh, government policy was still similar in a lot of ways to the prior administration, but different enough to allow for greater economic growth. So they were a little bit... Uh, or not more than a little bit better on uh, fiscal 
in monetary policy, the two biggest uh, macroeconomic policies. They also had some industrial policy. You know, they increased uh, by a lot the lending of the National Development Bank. So those policies, I think, contribute to, to the growth. Now, at the same time that growth increased, you also had government policies that directly or indirectly reduced uh, poverty and uh, inequality. And um, you just recently, um, I've been reading reports that uh, starting in, actually for the last two quarters, uh, there's been an economic slowdown. And I'm wondering if that has anything to do with, uh, maybe that would be speculating a bit much, but um, if, if that is related to the protests that were happening around the World, um, World Cup, and also uh, what the reasons might be for that economic slowdown. Why has that been going on? I mean, I know it's been relatively slight, but uh, that's one of the things that has been in the news recently about Brazil. Yes. Well, yeah, and the press has been very much against Brazil, and business press especially for the last few years. And, uh, well, not the last few years, it's been the last uh, year, year and a half. They've been treated more like, you know, the other left governments in South America, and business press especially. And uh, so the line you see in the media a lot, in the business press, is that the government has been too business unfriendly, and inflation, which hasn't really been that high. I mean, it's for every calendar year uh, since 2004, it stayed within the target range. The top of the target range is 6.5%, and the, the target itself is 4.5%. So it's maintained within the target range. But for the press, you know, the business press, which tends to be hawkish on these things, uh, they think that, uh, that that's the big uh, problem. But I would say it's really kind of the opposite. You know, Brazil has, uh, like Wall Street we have here, uh, they have a very powerful financial interest, uh, and they uh, push the country to kind of drive the economy of one foot on the brake. Now, they did that considerably less uh, from 2003 to 2010, and that's why Brazil had this growth that it hadn't had for, you know, more than 30 years. But then in 2011, at the end of 2010, they started tightening uh, both uh, monetary and then fiscal policy. In the last few years, uh, that's the reason uh, why you have the slowdown in economic growth. Now, unemployment has still stayed very low. It's still at a record low. It was 4.9% uh, uh, for the first quarter. And uh, that, uh, so it, it's some of that is for people leaving the labor force, but not, not all of it. Uh, there are other reasons for it. So overall, if you look at the whole uh, 13 years of the PT government, the vast majority of people have done uh, much better. You know, the minimum wage increased by 84% in, during this time. In real inflation-adjusted terms, that's really huge. And that, uh, again, that affects not only just minimum wage workers, but people above them, even the self-employed, and it affects government workers whose salaries based on the minimum wage. So all of these people, there was really big increases in spending, a uh, large increase in, in social spending went from 13 to 16 percent of GDP, which is a lot, especially when you consider that growth increased so much. So again, if you compare this uh, to anything in the past, even the you know the Cardoso administration, those eight years, which were somewhat better than the you know the uh, prior 20 years, um, it's still something that you you know that. Well, I mean, that's why this government was re-elected in, in the last election, and will probably be re-elected again. Hmm. Do you have a question? Yeah. Hi, Mark. Um, so I uh, hey. got a question for you. What do you think accounts for the um, low unemployment rates, um, despite having sort of slower growth over the last two or three years? 
Well, that's a good question. That is a tough one to answer because you can't really determine it uh, from the data that easily. You know, the central bank looked at it. They said part of the reason was uh, what's slowed down is more uh, manufacturing and export sectors that, um, you know, industrial and export sectors that don't account, especially export. You know, export sector only accounts for maybe 5% of employment. So that slows the economy, but it doesn't have as much impact on the economy. And at the same time, you've had a shift towards the service sector. And this is partly because of the distributional changes. So as poor people and working people have gotten a greater share of the income, they buy more service. Their consumption is, is, is more towards services. And so the service sector uh, tends to employ more people. Per, per you know unit of, of production or value added, and so so some of it is that shift uh, towards the service sector. Uh, some of it is people uh, leaving the labor force. You've had a drop in the labor force in the last in the in, in labor force participation in the last two years, uh, but not even all of that is necessarily a negative thing. You're not all leaving because there's no job. Some of them, for example you had a very large increase in uh, educational access in the university level in the last decade. It's in the millions of additional people who have gone to, to school and to college. And so some of those people are not in the labor force. And that lowers the unemployment rate, right? Because if you're not in the labor force uh, and you're not working, you're not counted as unemployed. So those are, I think, the main things uh, that have... Uh, kept the unemployment rate lower, uh, even as the economy is slow. Uh, but you have to realize that, um, I mean, we have to acknowledge that, um, you know, the, the labor market is not as strong uh, relative to three years ago, despite the continued decline in unemployment. So in other words, you've had a decline in unemployment, but since some of that is people living, leaving the labor force, there's still a, a lot of slack in the labor market. And that's why I you know, like to emphasize that uh, you, know, you see a lot of, especially in the business press, and if you look at uh, um, Dilma's opponent, uh, who has very concerned, uh, our main opponent right now, Marina Silva, was very conservative, uh, neoliberal economic advisors, you know, these people are saying, well, you know, uh, the labor market is very tight, unemployment's gotten too low, and uh, therefore wages are being pushed up, and that's pushing up inflation. And I don't really see, we didn't find really any evidence for that. And that's the problem, I mean, with economic policy, right? The central bank reacts to these inflation numbers, even in 2011, when the inflation was really coming from commodity prices from outside the country. It wasn't coming from, you know, the Brazilian economy overheating at all. And they uh, pushed for higher interest rates and tighter monetary policy and tighter fiscal policy as well, that is spending budget policy. And so this is uh, this is the problem. They still have this conservative uh, interest pushed, especially by the financial sector, uh, obsessed with inflation. Um, even though there's no chance they're going to have any kind of runaway inflation, uh, and that's what's really slowed the economy. So even though you are at record low unemployment rates. Uh, it is a little, the unemployment, the labor market is, is somewhat weaker. It's not, it's still pretty, pretty good, especially compared to the Workers' Party took sort of office. The uh, unemployment rate was 12.3%. Okay, so there's been a long, steady decline in unemployment throughout this uh, decade. Uh, but it's, it's not as strong as the headline number would indicate relative to two years ago. Um, if that's the case, I mean, maybe I'm asking you to speculate a bit much, but uh, what impact do you think this, uh, these most recent developments in the economy will have for the upcoming elections? Well, I think, 
it really depends on how the electorate sees it, obviously. Uh, you know, uh, if I think that most of the electorate, and you can see the polling data, that we, uh, there was a poll just the other day that, you know, poor people were like uh, two to one in favor of Dylan. Uh, even though, you know, uh, Maria Silva comes from a, a poor background and the, the press is playing that up a lot. Um, so I think they're going to look at these. This is a huge transformation of the Brazilian economy in the last 12 years, and I think that's how they're going to look at it, uh, especially since, you know, the trends have held up even as the economy is slow, you know, it's not just unemployment, wage growth, you know, wages were falling until 2003, almost 2004, even, and the average wage, and now the, and then the average real wage went up, straight up, uh, since then, it's grown over 35%, again, real inflation adjusted term, not as much as the minimum wage, but quite a bit, and, uh, and that rate of growth has held up even since 2011 as the economy slowed. That, to me, uh, shows that there's been a real change in the relations between uh, labor and uh, employers in the country. The bargaining power of labor has increased. And I don't see that uh, changing. So I think, that, uh, I, I think that most voters are still going to vote. Uh, for Dilma, uh, because uh, if you compare this last uh, 12 years with anything going back to 1980, it's just, uh, it's no comparison, really. Hey, Mark. Um, so one of the th um, po policies under um, uh, Marina Silva's uh, political platform is that she's been calling for um, increased autonomy for the Brazilian central bank. And, and I was wondering what, if you could just speculate a little bit, what impact that might have on a lot of the social welfare programs that have been uh, implemented under uh, Dilma and, and uh, prior under uh, uh, Lula. Yeah, that's a very good question. You know, independence of the central bank, it sounds nice. You know, like the Supreme Court should be independent. Well, the central bank is not the Supreme Court. And, you know, there's an argument you can make for an independent judiciary that's supposed to interpret the laws and, and so on. Uh, there's not really a good argument to make for an independent central bank, even though most economists believe in it. It's just, I mean, this is a a body that's determining economic policy. If you're going to say that they shouldn't be accountable to the elected government, then you might as well say that the members of Congress who set uh, budget policy uh, shouldn't be accountable to the elected. I mean, it really just not a good logic to it. What it does is it says, it's a very, so it's a conservative position she's taking. You know, in reality in Brazil, the central bank is kind of autonomous. It has a certain more autonomy than even the law, the law says that it's not the law. Under the law, it's it's it is uh, part of the executive or it's accountable to the executive. Uh, but whereas our Federal Reserve, for example, is is independent. Or but but that in 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 reality, uh, it's more independent than a lot of the central banks in the world that uh, are formally independent. So she wants to make it formally independent. Yeah, that would make things a lot worse. Because then they would be even less concerned with uh, sending the economy into recession uh, when inflation picks up and less concerned with employment uh, than they are now. And hurt, uh, that would hurt poor people. Now, you asked specifically how would it would affect the social program. Well, if the economy grows a lot slower, the government's got less revenue. Uh, for social programs as well. So it's going to hurt uh, poor people both directly through the labor market, through employment, and also uh, through, the, uh, through the budget. 
And would it also impact um, uh, international financial institutions like the uh, the funding of the new the new BRICS bank and the uh, Bank of the South? Could you could it potentially do you think um, if the in a scenario in which uh, the uh, Brazilian central bank were more even more f like formally uh, autonomous, um, do you think it would uh, potentially um, impact that or? I'm not sure. Yeah, I think the central bank will have some. I, I don't know. The autonomy makes a difference there because, you know, where the autonomy makes a big difference is they're deciding on the policy rate. The main policy rate is called the Selic rate, where Brazil right now has among the highest real interest rates in the world, and uh, and has for a long time, most of the last you know twenty years. And so that's where they're going to make a, a difference. They're going to set interest rates higher uh, then, um, and slow the economy more if they are not accountable or they are less accountable uh, to the executive. You know, Marina Silva's economic program is a very conservative program. You know, the other part of that is she's also calling uh, for the inflation target to be lowered uh, from 4.5 to 3 percent and also for inflation to be cut in half so uh, you know that's uh, if, if, if the central bank really did that you're talking about really throwing the economy into a deep recession I'm not sure she really understands that but her advisors uh, probably do okay um well, I think uh, I think we covered almost everything that we wanted to cover. Um, so thanks for joining us for this call, and we're going to put it up on on uh, YouTube. And uh, maybe one last thing, one last question is: When do you think that the report that uh, you've been mentioning uh, will be out? Oh, it's definitely out Monday. I mean, I can send you a copy right now. Wow. Okay, great. Well, I just wanted to tell the viewers then to watch out for it at seeper uh, net, and. Um, well, thanks again so much for joining us, okay? Sure. Thank you, Greg. Okay. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.